So this is you and your mum, and you probably age two or three, I think? I think so. Um, my parents um, both really valued education and really supported my brother and I to get the best education we could, but because of their own circumstances, hadn't had the chance themselves to finish school. And I was determined as a young kid I would become a musician. And I remember one of the most traumatic events of being a young kid was probably at 10 or 11, I said to my mum, I really want to go to the Sydney Conservatorium High School. And she looked into it and said, no, you're not going. And I remember just being absolutely devastated. And her reason? Her reason was that they didn't teach science. And she thought I was too young at 10 or 11 to cut off my options. I had no glimmer then that I would want to study science. So I thank my mother enormously for not An amazing woman. letting me go. Yes. So when did you start playing the cello? I think I was probably about six. Wow. And I understand that that actually got you a scholarship, but with a twist. Oh, look, it was interesting. I, um, I was perfectly happy at the school I was at, but my mum, who scours the papers, um, saw that there was an ad for a scholarship to a school in Sydney that was a music scholarship and said, would you like to apply? And I said, sure, let's do it. And went along and I played the piano and I played the cello. And they looked at me and said, how would you feel about playing the pipe organ? Not quite the same. And I thought, okay. And essentially, I think it's because I played the piano quite well and I've got big feet, you know, for the pedals. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up winning a pipe organ scholarship to school, to Skeg Starlinghurst in Sydney. Very nice. Mm. And so is it um, in that high school time that you got into science? Yeah. In fact, it was when I was in year nine and I had a, just an amazing physics teacher. His name was Hugh McCallum, Mr. McCallum, and yep. so I learnt physics with a Scots accent. I think a physics is with a Scots accent. It's quite cute. Very nice. Um, <laughs> but I think for me it was just that suddenly I could see how maths, which I'd always just loved maths as you know patterns and playing and almost like games, but suddenly I saw how it was like a tool to understand our world really simply. And you know that's one thing I feel really passionately about actually is that. Often, it really breaks my heart when I talk to kids who say, oh, you know, physics or science or maths, that's hard. Yep. Because in reality, if it's taught well, it just all fits together. You know, you don't need to remember that much because you can work it out. And it's sort of simple and it makes sense. So good teachers make a huge difference. Pivotal. Mm. Now, I understand you still play the cello. Yeah, I do. Excellent. And I think she has brought one with us today. Now, while that's being brought over, this is a very special cello. Can you tell us why it's so special? This is a very, very special cello. I think it's the only one of its kind in Adelaide. It's not made of wood, as most cellos are. It's made of carbon fibre. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, and I brought this along because I thought you might enjoy seeing how um, the wonderful thing that the cello or any string instrument is can be married together with new technologies mm. in materials to make something that really is quite special and where we take advantage of the properties of the materials to make something better. I'm going to play the prelude from the first Bach suite. And the reason I've chosen this is because, for me, I don't know how many of you listening or in the audience today enjoy music, but for me, Bach is everything that I adore about maths and science. It's simplicity, it's elegance, it's pattern, it's mathematics, it's beauty. Sounds wonderful, I can't wait to hear it.
touch, and that is an amazing looking instrument. It really is quite, amazing. quite special. Beautiful. And Thank indestructible, you. which is a nice thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. What subjects did you study in Year 11 and Year 12? Uh, I did the maximum amount of maths, um, physics, chemistry, maximum music. Yep. And in Year 11, I studied ancient history because I really enjoyed that, just for something different. Very nice. And can you, is there anything else you want to talk about in terms of that maths and music <sighs> linkage? Is it, uh, would you recommend studying both of them at the same time? Um, absolutely. I think that the part of the brain that we use to, to unravel science problems and puzzles, the persistence, the resilience, the dedication, the, the ability to deal with complexity, that is what we need to be a really good scientist, is exactly the same as what you learn playing music. I think probably the best thing that ever happened to me is that at the high school I went to, while I was always the best music student, I was never the best at physics or maths. And never, never, never. There was one girl at my school who always was just ahead. And the best thing about that is I always tried harder. I always pushed myself to see what I could do. And I'll never forget when I got my Year 12 results ran to the post office to see what I'd got, and I got my physics mark, and I'm like, yes, 98. I'm sure I've beaten her this time. I rang her up, and she got 99, so. <laughs> Just pipped at the post. But look, it was the best thing for me, because it always made me see how I could be the best I could be. Drove you. Yeah. So you finished school with flying colours. Well, you, the context of this article is because of the score I got in music in year 12, I was one of 20 kids selected to go on an international cruise and play overseas. And the journalist came along and just assumed that I wanted to be a muso. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to do a science degree at the University of Sydney. And, you know, they seemed quite surprised at that. Um, in, in, in the newspaper article, it seemed, you know, to think that was a strange choice. Because you were so good at music or because not many girls go into physics? Look, to be honest, I don't think I looked like what they thought of someone who would be a scientist. I guess the stereotypes run pretty hard and deep, and still, if you ask young kids to draw a scientist, you tend to get, you know, a man with big glasses, a beard, and a white lab coat. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So you're breaking down those barriers. But are there any issues that you've come across as being a woman studying physics, perhaps at university, in your career now? Look, you know, it's, it's still a career where we don't have enough girls going in or staying in science and sadly I've got used to often being the only woman in a room. Um, you get used to that and the sad thing is I don't notice it at times. Yes. But looking back to studying, I think the most obvious thing that I really remember feeling is I'd come out of an exam and beat myself up, you know, oh, I don't think I did very well, I don't think I'm good enough. And I was quite impacted by the fact that on the whole, the guys in my cohort would come out going, I rocked that, like, you know. And I would just think I'd almost lose the will to go on because I'd think I'm just not good enough to do this. Um, often when the results came out, I'd done better than the majority of them, but it's the confidence thing. And, and I guess I'd, I'd urge you to just um, not let any choices you make be rocked by your perception of other people seeming more confident than you feel. Good advice. Yeah. So when did you discover photonics specifically? Well, when I was at school and I discovered a joy for physics, I started just reading anything I could get my hands on, um, whether it was new scientist or popular science books and the like. And, and I really got excited by astrophysics and cosmology and the big questions of why is the universe the way it is and why is it expanding or, you know, what is a black hole? And I went to uni thinking, I know I want to do a PhD in physics, probably astrophysics. But then I was in my first year at university and I knew research, I thought research was something you did, you know, after your degree. And I saw a sign on the wall that said, summer project available, first year's welcome to apply. It was in the topic of photonics and I really didn't know much about photonics at the time, but I thought, wow, if they're going to accept a first year, I'll go and put my hand up. And I went along and I had a chance for the first time to start to learn how to do research in photonics and why I was hooked was this. Um, you can come up with an idea and you can do the maths or the computer modelling simulations to figure out what light does, how light travels through a certain material, what happens if you pose a sort of a thought experiment of light, what happens to the light. Then 
you can test it by making something, by doing an experiment. Sometimes you'll get what you predicted. Sometimes, and quite often, you'll get something completely different, and it might be because your experiment's wrong, or it might be because there's something deeper going on that you can unravel. But then for me, the trifecta is not only can you be creative and come up with an idea, you can test it, but you can work on something that can make a difference, that can be really useful. And for me, what hooked me was the ability that when you're working on something, not only are you creating new knowledge, but you can do something nobody else has done before and you can solve problems. And you know, for me, I'm not trying to put off any potential astrophysicists we might have in the audience, because no, it's a wonderful not. and exciting field. Great area. <laughs> but for me, why I didn't go into that field was that I didn't like the fact that the work you were doing might turn out in the future to not be right because of things we don't currently know. And I like the fact that in photonics you can test things. And thus that gives you that freedom to be a bit more creative because you can see if it works. So, mm. university, you've completed your undergraduate degree, you've completed honours, and then you went into a PhD. Was this then in photonics? It was. Um, up until my honours degree, I'd been really doing theory and computer modelling of photonics. And in my PhD, I had a lot of fun because I predicted how light would travel through certain types of materials and showed how you could use light to create its own guide, waveguide within the material. But then I got about halfway through and I realised maybe I could test this. And I got to do that in my PhD as well. Um, and that, for me, I guess when I look back, was the foundation for the whole approach that I've shared with you in my talk, because I, I really believe that one of the most exciting things you can do in science is not be categorised into a really simple, a single field, but it's to straddle multiple fields. And for me, I started by doing theory and experiment. And as I've gone on, I've started to work across different boundaries with people in different fields, and it's been a lot of fun. Yes, and you can see, when we talk about STEM, you can see the elements of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the work that you're doing in that area of photonics. Look, you know, I, the work that I publish with my team sometimes goes in maths journals, chemistry journals, physics journals, engineering journals. It's not pure and simple physics. Absolutely. Yeah. And I understand that you met your husband at university. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? So David and I met in um, first year uni um, and he asked me out on his 19th birthday, so it's quite a long time ago. We yes. had married 20 years come January. Um, it was actually quite a funny thing for me because he'd come from an academic family, whereas I said I came from a family that hadn't, neither of my parents had had the opportunity to finish school. Um, and in fact, his um, father, Gordon, taught us first year maths at university, so that was a strange experience. A little awkward, perhaps? Yeah. I, I do remember at least one occasion we were booted out of a lecture. So the work that you did after your uh, doctoral research, that allowed you to travel. Where did you end up? I, I chose to go to the University of Southampton in the south of England, and I went there age 25, just after my PhD, and I thought I'd go for two or three years and then come back to Australia. But I guess what I'd never expected is that when I went there, I'd just love it so much and that I'd really fall on my feet and really love being at the centre of you know, an industry university ecosystem that allowed you to work on really meaningful problems and ended up staying seven years. Oh, wonderful. And I guess that's one of the benefits of a science degree is being able to travel... Absolutely. I mean, Australian students that um, go overseas, whether to do a PhD or whether to work afterwards, are among the best in the world. And it's lovely going to a completely different environment and using those skills and, and making a difference. I think, you know, science is one of the most international of careers, whether because you can work overseas or, you know, I don't think a day goes past where I'm not communicating with a colleague overseas on a project. It's, it's really exciting. It makes the world smaller. And you're yeah. certainly not one of those scientists in a lab coat beavering away on your own. Usually only when someone wants to take a photograph that makes me look like a scientist. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and I understand in the UK you had one of your greatest career achievements. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Look, it's hard to pin down one thing, but I guess the thing that I um, felt made the biggest conceptual leap was related to what I told you about in the talk, which is the idea that as long as you could take a material and make it soft enough to extrude through a die, and you can see at the top left there, one of these dies, you could shape it into any pattern you liked. 
And this really transformed the field because not only did it mean that any extrudable material could be turned into an optical fibre, but it also meant that the cross-section, the pattern that you put into it was only limited by your imagination. And in fact, you know, even now, this was first done, um, my team did, was the first group to ever do this back in 2001. Now, with the work we've done at Adelaide, which is now the best extrusion lab in the world, which is very exciting, um, we can extrude any material and we can put an arbitrarily complex pattern in the material. But one really cool recent development that we just published this year, we, we can now extrude glass through three-dimensionally printed, 3D printed dyes. So all the previous dyes were just machined, milled, um, cut. Yep. But now that you can 3D print a dye, you're really only limited by your imagination in terms of what patterns you can put into the glass. Definitely crossing over those areas of STEM, isn't it? Well, I guess what I'd, what I'd say is that perhaps what you might not realise is that in 99% of the places around the world where people do glass research, the people doing it are glass chemists. They make the glass, they characterise it, and that's the end of the story. What you need to take it on beyond that is you need the optical physicists who know how to use it to turn it into a device that controls light. So that's you know, been the hallmark yes. of what we've done here in Adelaide, which is bring together the glass chemists with the optical physicists and all those other fields that allow you to do something you couldn't do separately. Can you tell us a little bit more about IPAS? So IPAS, the Institute for Photonics and Advanced Sensing, um, is now six years old. Um, it was really um, what came... It was a venture um, that was funded by federal government and state government and the University of Adelaide and led to us building that wonderful building that I showed you the picture yes. of earlier. And what it is, is it's 200 physicists, chemists, biologists, material scientists who are coming together to say, if you no longer have to limit your questions you ask in your science by the tools, the measurement tools you can buy off the shelf, what would you do? What question would you ask if you could measure anything? And that's what IPAS is about. And it's really exciting um, having, I guess, seeded something that's so powerful. And what IPAS is also about is um, listening to industry, listening to the real world and saying, what is it that you can't do at the moment? So one beautiful example is we're working with the mining industry to develop ways of measuring the mineral content of a hole that you drill, an exploration hole you drill in the ground, in order to be able to, at the time you do the drilling, the exploring, to tell what is there at that site. At the moment, they have to send samples off to the lab, and by the time they come back, they've had to move the exploration kit somewhere else. Imagine if you had the information to make the decision right then. Or imagine if you go to the doctors because you need a vaccination, you blow into a device and it tells you you've got early stage gastric cancer and because we've caught it now, your prognosis is much better than it would have been if you waited till you have symptoms. And I know these seem like really different things, mining and cancer, but really they're just examples of some of the projects we've already worked on. Yeah. And I guess what you're saying there is, I'm thinking back in terms of being high school students, all the people who are watching online are in high school, they're learning what they might consider to be, I don't know, um, the basics. Yeah. That is essential, isn't it? In order to have that foundation of knowledge, those, that skills foundation, in order to then get to the point where you can start doing this amazing work that you're doing, finding the relevance within the real world. Absolutely. I mean, I'd encourage all people with a passion and an interest in a science career to... Well, number one, keep up your maths at the highest level. Do the most maths you can do, whatever your interest in science is, whether it's biology, chemistry, physics, geology, whatever it is. But then pick the area that's your passion and get as good at it as you can. Study it, you know, it, at university, specialise in it. Um, and then once you've got that under your belt, that sort of domain expertise, then if you choose to engage across the disciplines like the work I've told you about in IPAS, you've got that foundation you can bring to the table. Perfect. Now, let's move on and have a look at your family. So here you have one son, twin boys, and I understand you have twin cats as well. Is that true? Yeah, um, we had the cats before the boys, but right. you know. Right, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, we know that you're very busy with your family and your work. How do you actually balance such a busy life? I actually think having the family makes it 
easier in a way because I guess I've learned, like many busy people, to just be really present in what you're doing. Yep. So when I'm with the boys, you know, they're 8, 8 and 11, you know, you, I'm not working. I'm just with them. And, but when I'm at work, I really want to make sure I'm productive and get something meaningful done so that the time away from, from them is valuably spent. So I just think the balance helps you be the best you can be. Um, I'm not saying it's not busy, and I'm not saying there are things that sometimes when I'm juggling, I drop a ball. Yes. But hopefully I keep the important ones in the air. Good. I think that's some good advice there. You're passionate, dedicated, very successful, and you do win a lot of awards. What's so amazing about winning these awards? To be honest, it's often <laughs> quite a shock and a surprise. The, one, the image on the left is with our recently ex-departed governor of South Australia, the Honourable Kevin Scarce. And that was the Australian of the Year Award for South Australia. I really, I didn't know who'd nominated me. I had up until that point really thought of myself just as a scientist, head down, bum up, you know, doing what I do. Yep. Um, and to the fact that someone in the community had sort of thought that was worthy of broader recognition was quite a surprise to me. Um, it was also very good for me because it meant that suddenly I was being forced into situations where I was talking about things other than specialised science to my peers and a chance to kind of engage broader with the community about why yes. science matters and that's really shaped my life. Um, in the other image, which was the Prime Minister's Science Prizes, um, I think that, that recognition made such a difference in terms of my capacity to bring in the funding required to build really good teams. Because one thing I'd say, when you're doing this transdisciplinary science, you need to have enough critical mass, enough scale, that you can have people with all those different discipline backgrounds working on problems. So you need a lot of funding. And I think you know, that recognition helps build a big team.